Good morning, church. Good to see each and every one of you. So glad you're here. Man, I'm blessed to be here with you. Amen? You're blessed to be here? All right. Good to see each and every one of you. If you're worshiping in the house this morning, what a great group today, by the way, too. Hey, let's show some love to all of our first-time guests here in the room and online right now. Can you welcome them? We're so, so thankful that you're here. I want you to know there's a place for you here, and we want to share some appreciation for all of our soldiers. Let's go ahead and lift it up for all of our soldiers and their families. Fort Riley, I know the I know the op tempo is pretty high right now. I was talking to some soldiers before the service and in and out of the field and going back to the field, more training and, and some deploying overseas with all that's going on around our world. So we want you to know you're in our prayers and you and your family, and we're here for you. We're so glad that you're a part of the Jason S family. I'm so blessed to be called your pastor. Can I just tell you that this morning? Can I just, um, I don't say that enough to you probably, but I want to share it again this morning. So blessed to serve alongside so many wonderful people who have a heart for the Lord and a heart to point others to Him, and, and just so blessed to think about all that God's going to do in our midst, in and through us over these next 11 months. Can you believe we're into February already? January's gone, y'all. Just gone. I don't know where it went, but it's, it's gone, all right? And we got 11 more months to give, it, give Christ all we got, and uh, I believe He's going to do some amazing things among us. Come on, how many of you are glad that we serve a God of blessing, amen? God who wants to... The Bible is just filled with example after example, illustration after illustration of God wanting to pour his blessing out on his people. But I want to quickly remind you the reason for it all. The reason he has blessed us and continues to bless us so mightily as a church is so we can in turn be a blessing to others. Right? He never wants that to end in a dead end road in your heart. He wants, you to, he wants to be a conduit of his blessing. And so we believe that with all of our heart. One of the greatest ways, one of the most powerful ways to be a blessing to people around us um, is by pointing them to Jesus so he can, so he, they can experience his mighty love for themselves personally. And so you have an opportunity and a calling really to do that every day if you're a Christian. And next Sunday is going to be an amazing time to invite somebody. We have some really fun things going on around the Super Bowl, surrounding the Super Bowl, some fun things out in the lobby. Um, our security team has been directed, if you see anybody in Broncos gear, they're to be tased on the spot, okay? So... So security team, you are on duty next week, and, and you, have your, you have your mission. Hope you understand the assignment. I want to see that. Anyway, I um, forgot what I was saying. Oh, next Sunday, but then <laughs> the real opportunity you have, I say the real, the, another great opportunity you have to point someone to Jesus is coming up in about two months. In about eight weeks. Do you know what's coming in eight weeks? It's, it's Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to be excited for Resurrection Sunday at J.C. Naz. It's going to be it's going to be out of it's going to be so incredible. I can't wait. Um, our pastoral team, we all have a little tightening in our chest right now because when we we're in Easter mode already. We're in Resurrection Sunday planning mode. It's going to be great, but we're all like, it's going to be here before we know it. So we're putting things together. But I want you to begin praying right now, okay? Begin asking yourself this question: Who will meet Jesus this Easter because of me? Who's going to be? If you just ask that, would you commit to asking that every day? Who's going to meet Jesus 2024? This, who's going to encounter his resurrection presence and power because of me, my influence, my invitation? So you begin praying towards that with us. Would you do that? I'm telling you, it's the greatest privilege we have as a church. It's why we exist, to let others know about the wonder of our Savior. And I want to help you at church focus on what we're doing here as a church, what we're all about. I think it's one of my main roles is to keep that vision burning brightly before you. And the reason every time we gather, here's the reason. We want to walk more closely with Christ, and we want to be more committed to his mission. Right? Right? Is that a vision worth getting out of bed for in the morning? Absolutely. Is that a vision worth giving your very life for? Absolutely, I believe it is, and I'm giving my life to it. I'm so glad to be with uh, such a great family who's doing the same thing. All right, well, today, um, my goal is very simple, and I just want to get that out in front of you and uh, just tell you that straight up. My goal is very simple today, and it's simply this. I have one major goal, and that is if you're here today and you have never been baptized, you're a follower of Jesus, you say, I love Jesus, I love his word, I'm committed to following him and, and growing in the faith in Christ, but I've never been baptized. You know, may, or maybe you were baptized as an infant or a very young child, and that, that seems like a lifetime ago, and, and you, you know, don't even really remember it, but as you've heard us teach about this, Throughout the years, as you've witnessed many, many people getting baptized here or at the lake or wherever we baptize, you've sensed a stirring in your spirit that I, I need to take this step of faith because I've never been baptized. But maybe, maybe you've been neglecting it. Maybe you've been putting it off. You've, you've had good intentions, but you got busy. You got distracted. Maybe you, you had a lot of excuses as to why you didn't need to. Listen, my goal today is to encourage you, if you're in that camp, to encourage you 
to help by God's Spirit to remove every one of those hesitations and excuses and rationalizations and encourage you to be bold and step up and step out in faith and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit this Wednesday. This Wednesday, we're having our next baptism service. I'm going to say a lot more about that, but this Wednesday, go ahead and mark it down, February 7th, 6.30 p.m. during our Fan the Flame prayer and worship gathering right here, right here in this sanctuary, okay? It's going to be an amazing night, and that's the challenge for each one of you who, who that may apply to. But I want to help you see in a fresh way today through this message and through the Word of God why this matters why baptism is so important, why, why baptism should be something that every Christian, every true follower of Christ, it's a step that each of us should, should take or be desiring to take in our lives. It should never be, it was never intended to be a kind of take it or leave it optional thing that tragically has become that way for, for many people today. And really this message, if you'll hear it in this way, I think it'll change your life. This message is God's invitation to you. If you're a Christian and you've never been baptized, to say, come, come to me. Come on, come on, take my, take my word. Take my word by faith and come on and be baptized. And again, this week will be your, your next opportunity to do, that, to do that. Now, I understand that we have, really, there's two, when I talk about baptism, there's kind of two different groups here. Okay, not so evenly divided, but listening online, even there's two different groups there's a group of people who say, I love Jesus and I love his word and I'm committed to following him and honoring him and obeying him. And I've been baptized. And you remember fondly your baptism. You, you remember it with joy and you're walking in, in the joy of that. And, and, and so the temptation for you today perhaps is, this message doesn't really apply to me, Pastor Mark. I've been bad. I've done that, right? I'm, I'm, it's, it means a lot to me still to this day. But I don't want you to think that it doesn't apply to you today, all right? I believe this will be a great encouragement to you to remember that all the more, to reaffirm the importance of your obedience in your baptism and to realize that that, that was a, a moment of, of initial obedience where you stepped out and obeyed Christ, but, but that pattern of obedience is, is something Christ wants to see reflected daily in your life. And also, if you've been baptized and you're a Christian, this is something else you can glean from this message today is you can take what you're hearing here today, you can take what I'm sharing, and you can take it and you can share it with a friend in your life, a, a friend who needs to hear this. You can do it in your own way, in your own words, of course, but you can take this information. And I'm not talking about cold calling on people who aren't Christians. And, and, and uh, you know, th that, that strikes fear in our hearts sometimes. And i gotta, I got to talk to somebody about Jesus and share the gospel with them and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people in your life who you know who are Christians. They authentically have given their life to Christ. They're, they're for what we're doing right here. They're, they're maybe in the church right now. And, and someone in your life, in your circle of influence, I'm telling you, they need a trusted friend like you to share the truth and love with them and say, hey, now that you're a Christian, even if you've been a Christian for many years and put this off, now is your time. Come on, you need to step out in faith and you need to take this step of obedience and faith and be baptized. And hearing it from you might just, it, it may just be the nudge, right? It may, need, may be the encouragement they need to take that important step. So let's, let's dig into it a little bit here. What is baptism anyway? Well, it's getting in the water and it's getting wet, right? It's going under the water, it's coming up. Okay, okay yeah, yeah, partly. But at the heart of it, what, is it, what does it mean? Why does it matter? Okay, so you might want to write this down. Baptism, simple definition, baptism is simply this. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward transformation. I've described it in different ways over the years. I've heard different definitions. That's about as simple as I know how to say it, and it's one of the best ones. Baptism is an outward expression, an outward demonstration of an inward transformation in my heart through faith. It's this vital, powerful Witness, it's a demonstration uh, saying, this is who I was, and this is what I was, and this was where it was all heading, and yet somehow, by faith, Christ came down, and he rescued me, and he changed all that in response to one sincere prayer of faith. Amen? And so baptism becomes a reminder. It becomes a reflection of all that God has rescued us from. And it gives us an opportunity to express that to him and to others through baptism. So let me, let me just kind of show you something here in, in, in one of the Psalms. Psalm, I was reading Psalm 107 this week. And I want to show you three kind of three categories of people. 
And I think you'll be able to find your story in here. I think you'll be able to locate yourself in, in one of these three, if not all three. Now, Psalm 107 is not a baptism passage, okay? It's not, it's not teaching us about baptism, but I think there's some parallels here um, when it comes to when we hear the response of the people in response to what has, God has done in their hearts, the transformation that he's brought about, I think we're going to see a connection between our baptism and what that represents, what that symbolizes, and, and, and the response of these people to God's activity in their life. Okay, so what you're going to see here in Psalm 107, you're going to see a pattern. You're going to see a pattern again and again and over all these that I share. You're going to see a crisis or a problem. Some ways having a crisis. Someone's experiencing a deep, deep, desperate problem in their life. And they cry out to God in their trouble, in their distress. And, and out, in response to that cry, God does something miraculous. He rescues them. So you're going to see that. There's a problem, there's a crisis, they cry out and God responds, and then there's a response of praise and thanksgiving due to what God has done, all right? So you're going to see that very clearly in here, no trouble at all. So Psalm 107, first of all, here's the first one, the lost, the lost. Okay, some, it says, wandered in the wilderness. Now, understand, this is talking about an historical, this really happened physically and, and historically to these people, but we're, we're making a, a, a spiritual connection here, okay? So some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless, hungry and thirsty. They nearly died. And so you think about your, your life before Christ, perhaps. You think about maybe even where you are now. I don't know. You think about your life spiritually and in relation to God. Have you ever felt like you were lost and wandering? Ever in your life have you felt that way? Have you ever felt like you were in a wilderness and you were so empty, I remember feeling that way before Christ. I didn't know how to communicate it at the time, but now looking back, I, that's exactly what I felt. I was so empty. But I was stuffing my life with all this craziness and all this stuff and all this activity. And I, I had the appearance of being full and full of life, but I was so empty. I would never admit that to anybody, but that's what I was. Have you ever been hungering and thirsting in a time in your life, knowing there's more, but not knowing exactly what it was or where to find it? Anybody? Anybody at all? Well, look at these folks. They, they were in that predicament, and they, they have a great response. It's the response every one of us need to make if we haven't. This is, this is what I did 30 years ago plus now. So it says, Lord, help. They cried in their trouble. That's not a real fancy prayer, right? Not real theological. It's not, not real long for sure, but it's very sincere, and, and it's very powerful. To get God's attention. When you cry, Lord, help, I'm telling you, you say that sincerely and humbly. God hears you. He'll respond. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Let them, here it is, praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Listen, if you've ever in your life been lost, spiritually speaking, and if God has reached down into your mess and rescued you and brought you to a secure place of safety and salvation, if he's done a miracle in your heart, if he's done things for you that you could have never dreamed would be possible, if you look back on all that and you're like considering who I was and where I was and where all that was heading, and, and what God did, absolutely, he has done wonderful things for me. If that's your story, then listen, the natural response to that is one of praise and thanksgiving and giving glory to God, letting others know about that, amen? And that's part of what baptism is all about. It's part of why it matters. It's standing publicly and, 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 and intentionally and saying, letting others know I was lost, but now I'm found. I was wondering, I, I, I was wondering and apart from God and I had no real purpose in my life, but now, now I have purpose and now in Christ I have a future and now in Christ I have a hope. Amen, church? So the loss, the loss, he, he saves the loss. And here's another one, the rebel. The rebel, as we go through these three, you'll probably look at these and say, my goodness, I see myself in all three of these. I know, I know, me, me too, right? So, so you probably find yourself in one, but, but probably you can see yourself in all three as well. And so it could be, you look at this one, you say, that's, that's me, that's my story. Psalm 107, some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. They rebelled against the words of God, scorning, can you imagine, scorning the counsel 
of the Most High. So it becomes clear, right, they're in this desperate situation in darkness and gloom because of their own choices, their own actions, right? They have no one to blame but themselves. Sound familiar? Anybody? Only me. Okay, wonderful. Okay, just leave your pastor hanging up here in the wind. Great, wonderful. That, that's my story, okay? So here it is, same response, though. They make, a good, they make a good decision. Lord, help! Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress and led them from darkness and deepest gloom. I love this phrase, he snapped their chains. How many of you have ever seen a chain snap? You've been towing something? Boy, the sound is just like, it's so frightening. It's like... My dad would always, get back, you know, get back. You don't want to, this chain snaps, you're going to be in real trouble. Yeah, but that's the power of our God. Amen. He can snap our chains of bondage to sin. Amen. He snaps their chains. Let them praise the Lord. Here's the response. For his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. So if that's your life story, right, if you would say, hey, I was once in darkness and gloom. I was all wrapped up and surrounded in bondage by my sin and my shame, if you would admit I had no one to blame but myself, but yet through one desperate prayer, one desperate cry of faith to God, he rescued me. Amen. Come on, somebody. He rescued me. And it's not like I deserved it. It's not like I was deserving or earning of it in any way. It was only because of his great mercy and goodness and love and and, and he has absolutely broken the chains of my past. And, and, and once I was a former slave to sin and self and flesh. But now, now I'm living in the incredible freedom and joy that Christ alone provides. What should we do if that's our story? We should praise the Lord. Amen. We should praise the Lord. He saves rebels, church. Did you know that? What a glorious God. That's great news. And again, baptism... Baptism is a powerful, powerful way to, to share that story, to publicly praise God, to be reminded of what God did in your life. Here's the next one, Psalm 107, beginning of 17. The foolish, right? Some were fools, and of course, fools rebel as well, and they suffered for their sins. My goodness, this one hits me the hardest. When I think back to my life before Christ, I'll just tell you, I was such a fool. I mean, I've done a lot of, ask my wife, I've done a lot of foolish things since then. Don't get me wrong. But I was so foolish. I look back over my life and I see the massive amount of evidence. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it then and I didn't know how to articulate it certainly. But now looking back all these years later, I can see God standing there saying, would you just come to me? I love you. I'm for you. I want to be in relationship for you. If you'll just come to me, I can help you. I mean, I can just see God standing there. I have everything you will ever need for now and for all eternity. Come to me and it's yours. And you know what my response was for a time? Nope. No thanks. I got this. I can do this. I can handle it. I know what's best for my life. No, I know what will make me happy. And I just blaze through life, man. I was just barreling through life and chasing after, grabbing after all the sinful things whatever, temporary satisfaction, thinking that's what it was all about. And there may be a, there may be a man or a woman sitting here, that's, that's the path you're on right now. And I'm telling you, God will hear you if you cry out to him. And maybe today's your day, but I'm telling you, it was, so, it was so foolish. And here, look at this, look how foolish it was. They couldn't even stand, they couldn't even stand the thought of food. They didn't know what was really would fulfill them and satisfy them. They were just gorging on the empty stuff of this world. They didn't know, they didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about the bread of life, Jesus. And they were knocking at death's door. Man, that's what I was doing. I was knocking. Oh, hello, anybody home, right? The wages of sin is death, correct? Correct? That's right from God's word. It's correct. And so they were knocking on death's door. But, but, they, they turned around and they said, Lord, help. They cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. So let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. And so you have the lost, and you have the rebel, and you have the fool. And yet here's the really awesome thing. No matter what they had done, no matter how long they had been away from the Lord, no matter how dark their lives had become, no matter how long they had been in that state, when they cried out to God, 
God responded in his grace, and he did a miracle. I'm telling you, a miracle. There's no other way to describe it, of transformation in their lives. And again, the natural response to that is one of praising God, pointing to him and saying, it's all because of my God. This is who he is. This is what he's done, right? We sang it. And without my God, nothing you see in my life currently would be possible. Right? That's, that's what it's all about. That's what should... That's what should flow out of each one of our hearts if that's been our experience. And again, as it relates to baptism, baptism is a powerful way of pointing back to all that and remembering all that and, and witnessing to all that, publicly praising God and, 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 and purposefully identifying myself as a follower of Jesus Christ, saying, again, that's my God and that's what he's done for me. And also, it's a powerful witness, baptism is. Because it's you standing up. If you've never been, it's you standing up and saying, hey, hey, if he could do it for me, guess what? I know he could do it for you. I know he could do it for you. And so, it's, it's remembering. It's praising. But listen, it's not just remembering what he's freed me from. It's also a powerful, a powerful point of reference, if you will, to the life he's called me to. Not just remembering what he's freed me from, I'm remembering, remembering he's called me to something amazing, new life in Christ. And so we see that side of it. You saw the freeing from in Psalm 107. You're going to see the free to live the new life he's called you to live in, in Romans. So look at Romans with me. Romans 6, beginning in verse 1. Let me set the context of this just a little bit. Paul is having a conversation with a group of Christians in the city of Rome. That's what the letter, the letter it was a letter to Roman Christians in the church of Rome, and at this point, he's saying, hey, he's been talking to them about God's grace and God's salvation and God, all these wonderful things, and yet there's some that are presuming upon God's grace. They're saying, oh, well, here's what we think. We kind of like to sin. You know, it's kind of pleasurable once in a while. We kind of like to dabble a little bit in our old life, and, and Paul, we understand from your words that God is a God of grace, and he loves to forgive, so we, we say that's quite a deal for us. We'll keep sinning, and we give God another opportunity to keep showing grace and forgiving. Praise God. And Paul, when he hears this, he's like, ah! <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's what he says. He says, well then, he's quoting them, should we just keep on sinning? Can you imagine a Christian, a true Christian saying this? But that's what they were saying. Can you, we should just keep on sinning so God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace. And Paul says, of course not. God forbid. Since you have died, we have died to sin. How can we continue to live in it any longer? You know, you know something is displeasing to God. You know something is contrary to, your, to his holy word. And you knowingly, willingly, intentionally continue to live in it. Paul says, I don't even have a category for that. That cannot be true in the life of a Christian, a true Christian. Or have you forgotten that we were joined with Christ Jesus, guess what, in baptism. We joined, when, we, when we joined him in baptism, we joined him in his death. For we died and we are buried with Christ by baptism. So you, are you getting the symbolism now? Have you, have you seen us do baptisms here when we go under the water? What are you doing? You're, you're being buried with Christ, right? We're, we're symbolizing that that has taken place. I've been died with Christ. I'm being buried with him. And when we raise you up in a few minutes, guess what? No, just joking, just joking. It's, it's seconds, seconds, okay? Some we kind of like to hold down a little longer. But no, we get you up in seconds. And, and when you're, you're raised up, he says, for we, were die, we died and buried. But just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we may also live new lives. He's talking about resurrected lives by his power. Praise God. So it's such a great word here, really. Paul, Paul though, you have to understand, he's not talking to those who have not yet been baptized but should. He's, really, he's, talking, to, he's talking to baptized Christians here. So it's a good word for those of you who have been baptized. This is a powerful reminder, but it's also, again, it's a word for those of us who are following Christ whenever you made that decision, but for whatever reason, you've never been baptized. This is a powerful reason for why you should be baptized. But he's talking to those who have already done that, right? And he's saying, hey, whatever you do, don't forget your baptism. In fact, I would suggest to you the reason some Christians could say, hey, I'll just keep on sinning so God could show me more grace and everybody's happy. The reason they would even think that way in that kind of deception and error is because they had forgotten their baptism. 
And, and Paul is saying, whatever you do, don't forget your baptism. Don't forget why this really matters. And so it's a, it's a powerful word to those who've been baptized. But again, it's an important word if you have not been baptized. Because here's what it is. It, baptism enables you to keep coming back to that moment. Not, not in a... Not, not so you can live in the past forever, but again, a, a remembrance. Just like I might think about my wedding day again and again and again. I go back to that moment to remember my covenant, to remember my vows, to remember what we promised before God and all those witnesses. In, in a very similar way, baptism has that powerful reminding and strengthening um, element to it. And you can keep coming back to your baptism. If you get baptized this Wednesday, for example... You can come back to this February 7th, right? I went under the water. I was raised up again with Christ, identifying with Christ in that way. And again, it's not that baptism saves us, okay? Just so we're clear, we don't teach that here at J.C. Naz. Because it's not biblical, right? We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Let no one boast, right? If we say that baptism saves, then that's adding something to the finished work of Christ, correct? Correct? Come on, church, back me up here. <laughs> this, is, this is straightforward Bible stuff. And, and so, yeah, so we don't believe that we have to add anything to it. We just put our faith in Jesus. But this is a demonstration of the transformation that came about when I called upon him in faith. But it's awesome because when you're baptized, you're standing there in that remembrance. And you're remembering that when you called on God in faith, he saved you when you put all your hope and faith and trust. It's not that the baptism saves me. But the baptism, in the baptism, you understand, there is a major shift in your life because of that obedience step, that faith step. You, a major shift in your thinking, in your perspective, in your focus, a major shift in your whole approach to life. And what I mean by that is now, through baptism, there's a point of reference that you can keep going back to. Every time you remember your baptism, you're like, listen, I died with Christ. I died to my old way of life. I died to my old way of thinking, my old way of relating, my old way of acting, my old way of responding, my old way of, of doing relationships in, in, in life, in the community, and in the church, right? All of it. My old life is dead. It was buried. And so practically speaking, catch this, whether it's a week after your baptism or a month or a year, or five years, or ten years. Listen, whenever temptation tries to sneak up on you and ambush you, whenever, whenever the enemy, the devil, tries to provoke you to go back and live in the flesh in those moments with those words or what you're looking at or in that relationship or whatever, it tries to suck you back into the dead end bondage of all that. Listen, all you have to do is remember your baptism. And say, this is who I am, and this is, I'll declare the praise of him who rescued me out of my darkness. You, you, through baptism, really what you're declaring is Galatians 2.20. You may not say that verse, you may not say it in these words, but this is exactly what you're declaring in your baptism. That I have been crucified with Christ, and you're looking at Mark Hatcher, but I no longer live. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and through me. The life I live in the body now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, praise God, church, who loved me, and he gave himself for me. And just as fully as he gave himself to me, guess what? I'm giving myself to him for the rest of my life. And it's such an encouragement, I believe, to think about that and to stand in that truth any moment you need to, that now I'm called to a new life. And I'm called to a life of purity and a life of power and a life of holiness and a life of righteousness. That's, that's the standard that God has set. Thank God I don't have to do that in my own strength and my own effort because that's exactly what Paul's talking about in Romans 6. Look at it again. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, by that same, very same power you have access to, you too are called to live that new life. And you can live the new life. Don't, don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let other Christians who are content to live down here deceive you and say it's okay if you live down here at this level. No, no, you're called to live a new life in Christ. Amen? Amen. And when you stand in baptism, you can remember that and point back to that. Listen, this is, this is the heart of it all. This is kind of where it's all, this is what this message is all about. Baptism is you and I courageously and obediently saying here and now, 
to God, to others here and now through this act of obedience and baptism, I'm drawing the line in the sand. And there is no going back to that. There is no going back to my old ways and my old life anymore. No, no, from this point on, I'm done playing games. From now on, God, I'm serious about living life your way. In fact, you can write that down. That's, that's the powerful statement that baptism makes. And you can remember this. This is why it matters. It's saying, God, I'm serious about living a God-centered, God-pleasing life at all levels. That, that's what you're saying when you're, you're baptized. I'm taking this step of obedience now, not because I understand everything about it. I mean, I haven't got it all figured out, perhaps. That's maybe where you are. But I'm, I'm stepping out in faith because I want to I want to be obedient to the Lord at every single level. I'm, I'm not taking this step of faith and baptism because I've got it all figured out in life and because I'm living a perfect life. You know, that's crazy. Sometimes I, I've heard so many people say this over the years. Well, I, I, I really want to get baptized. I think God's leading me to do that. But first of all, I need, to, I need to get some things figured out. My life's a mess. I need to get cleaned up a little bit, and then I'll get baptized. You know how ridiculous... Sorry, excuse me, I love you, but you know how crazy and ridiculous that is, how that sounds? That's like being all dirty and saying, I have to get cleaned up before I go take a shower. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it's not logical. And so God would be like, what? No, no, I'll save you, I'll cleanse you, I'll do the work of perfecting maturity in your life, but you stand for me now and declare the praises of, 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 of him who brought about that transformation in your heart. Baptism is also not you saying, hey, I'm going to be perfect and flawless from this point forward. No, none of us could say that. But what it is saying is I have drawn a line in the sand. I've got a new Lord. I've got a new commander. It's not me, right? And I will, from this point forward, I will do this. I won't be perfect probably, but I'm going to be obedient to every single thing I know the Lord wants me to do operating in his power. Amen? I'm not going to intentionally disobey. I'm not going to intentionally grieve the spirit. I will Everything I know he wants me to do, will I learn more? Absolutely. But the things I know he wants me to do now, I will move forward in faith and obedience. And so the life change, you understand, the powerful life change that comes and the ongoing transformation that comes through baptism comes through your obedient response to God. In baptism. What I'm saying is it's not the water that brings about the transformation. Because lots of people get wet and their lives don't change at all, right? I mean, there's lots of people that get into swimming pools and they get in jacuzzis and hot tubs and all this, but they, they don't, nothing changes for them. Their eternity certainly doesn't change at all. I mean, but the, the water does not save you. The water does not bring about the transformation. But listen, it's what happens in your obedience and the transformation that you're demonstrating in that way. Baptism is the demonstration of your love and your loyalty and your faithfulness to Jesus. You're saying to Jesus in that moment, I will love you and honor you and obey you forever and all my days. That, that's what you're saying. It's so, so powerful. Can you imagine God is so honored by that? Now, quickly, let me address a question that I, I get. There's lots of questions you may have, and we'd be glad to sit down with you. But one question that I get so many times, I, I think it, it needs to be addressed, and that is simply this. Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark, what if I've been? What if I was baptized as an infant? What if I was sprinkled as a, as a child? You know, in another church, in another tradition. Do I need to get baptized again? Here's how I would answer that. While I'm sure that your parents did that with a heart of love for you and for your very best in mind, and I'm sure it was a very, very special moment for your parents and those who witnessed it that day. Listen, here's the challenge with that. The challenge is when we read God's word. When we read God's word, we read nothing about infant baptisms. We, we just don't. And I don't say that to criticize your parents and say they were, oh, I'm just saying we don't read about it in the Bible. We, we just want to follow God's word, amen. That's, all, that's, the, that's the best way to stay on the right path. So we don't read about it, but what we do read about in the Bible instead is, is that part of the power of baptism is people personally intentionally choosing to declare their faith and their obedience in Christ in, in, after they've made the decision to trust Christ as Savior. That's what we read about all the time. In fact, in the Bible, check me and, and see if I'm wrong. You, 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 you never read about an unbaptized Christian. When someone gets saved, they get baptized. They put their faith in Jesus, they're baptized. I mean, like, 
usually like right on the spot. Acts chapter 2 is a great example of that. 3,000 came to faith that day at the, at the response to Peter's message, and they believed in the Lord Jesus, and they were baptized. And so again, it's not being critical of what your parents did, but I'm just challenging you a little bit, saying, here's where it really comes down to, what does God want to do in your life now? And what step of obedience is he calling you to take now as, as, a, as an adult who's who intentionally choosing this for, for for yourself, to walk in surrender to Christ and live the new life of Christ in his power. So um, let, me, let me just kind of stick this landing on this sermon with, with this passage, hopefully. Acts chapter 8, powerful passage. Um, a guy named Philip who is totally surrendered and sold out to Christ. He's being used mightily by Christ to point others to Jesus because there's no other greater aim in life, is there? Than to have my life used to point someone else to Jesus. May that be said of all of us. But Acts chapter 8, Philip is being used. There's a revival breaking out, actually, and Philip's kind of the, the instrument God's using, but God calls him away from that, interestingly enough, and amazingly enough, he obeys. And what God says, I want you to do is leave all this amazing supernatural things that are happening, and I want you to go out in the middle of nowhere, basically is what he's saying. I want you to go out in the middle of nowhere to the desert road because there's a guy that I died to save that's going to be coming your way. He's going to be in a chariot. He's a, he's a, he's a royal official. And, and he, needs, he needs to know me. And so Philip obediently goes, and he sees the chariot, and he goes, and, he, and, and, and the Spirit of God said, go stay near it. And when he gets near it, he's like running alongside of it, and he hears the guy reading out of the book of Isaiah, and he's reading about Jesus sacrificially giving his life so we could be saved of all of our sins and so we could know God up close and personal. And so Philip gets bold, and he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, how can I unless someone explains it? And then much to Philip's relief, I'm sure, the Ethiopian guy invited him to come up and sit in the chariot instead of continuing to run alongside of it. I'm sure that was a great moment for Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much. And he gets up in the chariot, and he begins with that passage of Scripture. What a model for us. He begins with that passage of Scripture, and he begins to explain to him the good news about Jesus Christ. And then here's what we get in Acts 8.36. And so they're going along. The guy gave his life to Jesus, okay? It's, it's apparent he gave his life to Jesus, and as they're going along the road, they came to some water, and the Ethiopian guy says, hey, here's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? Which is so cool to me, because not only did, did Philip show Jesus to him in, in his gentle approach and his love and his listening, not only did he explain the good news of Jesus and how this guy could be saved, he had to have explained baptism too because how otherwise, how would he have known? How would he have known that as a new believer in Jesus, he should demonstrate his faith and obedience in that way, but that someone loved him enough to tell him that, and Philip was that guy. And so he says, what should prevent me from being baptized? What a great question. In that fact, that's the question I want to present to you. What is it if you are a Christian and have not been baptized for any reason at all? It really doesn't matter why. You meant to, you wanted to, you never had the opportunity, no one told you about it. Whatever the reason is, what would prevent you from being baptized this Wednesday, February 7th at 6.30 in our Fan the Flame? What a great night that's going to be. You understand that? Powerful night of prayer, powerful night of worship, hearing God's word, celebrating new life in Christ. You'll never forget it as long as you live. I believe that. What would prevent you from being baptized? Now, listen, if you have a legitimate reason like, oh, man, I'm all in, but I absolutely cannot, then their next, very next opportunity, you'll have an opportunity to go ahead and get signed up today, and we'll get you on the very next opportunity. But what would prevent you? And if you have objections, if you have even excuses or rational, here's what I bet. You, we would love to talk to you about that, but I bet, I bet the Holy Spirit has the perfect answer and solution for every one of those, don't you think? This is his will for us, and he's going to help you do his will. So I'm going to challenge you practically, sincerely ask, do this right now. Lord Jesus, should I get baptized this week? Should I get baptized this week? J just literally asking that right now, right? What a great night to publicly declare your faith, right? Do, is, this, is this something, God, is this something that would please and honor you? I've just been praying so intensely that you would hear from God right now in this moment. Should, do you want me to do this, God? It's now my time. And if the answer is yes, here's a couple of practical action steps. Number one, scan that QR code. Go ahead and get your phone out right now. Scan that up. It works. I promise you I tested it out. And you scan it. It's going to take you to our JCNS Next Steps page. You're going to be able to uh, see frequently asked questions there. 
you, you can say, hey, I, 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 need, I, do need, I want some more information. You can fill that out. We'll respond to that. Or you can go ahead, if you know a certainty that now's your time, you can fill out the adult baptism story or the children's baptism story. You'll, it'll submit right to us. We will get back to you. Someone will contact you personally with the, the practical steps that you'll need to take so you'll be prepared to take that step of faith and baptism this Wednesday. Here's the second thing, though, very, very important. Listen carefully. Beyond doing that, that'll get the ball rolling, but you need to start inviting anyone you can think of to invite, right? What a powerful witness it is to stand. Now, you say, well, my family doesn't, they don't even know Jesus. My friends could care less about gathering on a weekend like this and worshiping. That may be the case, but I'm telling you, they may not believe in Jesus yet, but they love you, right? You're their friend, and I bet if you ask them, hey, I know this isn't really your deal, and I, I get it, and I'm not trying to force, but listen, if you would come, I would, I would love for you to be there. It would be such an encouragement to me, and you say that sincerely. It's not a guilt trip, but it's just like, man, I'm inviting you as your friend. I want, I'm going to do this. This is very important to me. I bet they'll come, amen? And when they come, they may hear a message. They may see something. God may visit them in a way that may change their lives forever, and, and so if you're going to get baptized, start praying now. Who can I invite? Who should I invite? Who, who needs to know? Tell everybody you can, all right? So there's the two practical action steps. And let me close with this for all of us, all of us, no matter where you fall. This is, a, this is the question that all of us need to answer. Would you pray this right here? God, God, what do you want to say to me about my life? Right now, I'm a month into 2024. Am I on the track you want me to be on? Just Would you just go ahead and maybe just... Nothing really interesting to see up here. I'm, I'm not, you just go ahead and bow and just pray that. Just, God, what do you want to say to me about my life? About the direction, about my priorities, about my relationships, anything. Just as an open book, transparent before God, God, examine my life. God, if you have something to say about my life, I want to hear it because I, I need to know this and I want to follow in obedience. Just ask him. He's so faithful. If you're asking that with sincerity, I promise he'll answer. It may not be in this moment, but you keep seeking him for that, he'll let you know. And it could be for some of you, the answer is, you need forgiveness for your sins. You need to be brought into right relationship with me. You know, it could be for some of you, that when I was going through Psalm 107, and I was talking about the rebel and the lost and the fool, you're like, oh my goodness, that... That describes my life. That's, that's who I am. I, I've been knocking at death's door. I've been, I've been chasing. I've been, I've been lost and wandering and empty and hungry and thirsty. And, and yet you realize today that Jesus alone can satisfy the deepest need in your life. And you're ready to do perhaps what the people in Psalm 107 did, to cry out, God, help me. God, save me. And if you're ready to do that right now, listen. We, we just believe in connecting you to Jesus in a very simple way. We don't have, you don't have to come up front. You don't have to join the church. You don't have to stand up and say anything and make a speech. But if you want to pray that prayer, I'm going to lead in just a second. I do, ask, I do think you ought to be bold. I think you ought to be bold and just let God know right now. Just slip up your hand. Just say, Pastor Mark, I'm praying that prayer with you right now. If that's you, praise God. Thank you for your courage. I love quick hands. I love quick hands, man. Just boom, that's me. I need him so much. Is that you? Is that you praying that prayer with me right now? God will hear you. God will save you forever. All right, let's pray together. Just pray it from your heart. He can hear even the faintest whisper, but pray it in faith. Just say, God, I need you. And I'm crying out to you today in faith. God, save me. God, forgive me. God, cleanse me of all, every wrong thing I've ever done. God, in faith, I cry out to Jesus, who I believe is the Son of God. I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again. I, I believe he did everything necessary so I could know you and be in relationship to you. So I pray in faith. You're my only hope, God. I need you so much. So, God, I open my heart to you. I give my life to you today. God, lead me in your power. God, the power of your spirit inside of me. Help me to live from this day forward the new life in Christ. 